So every company kind of has its thing that makes that company the way they are. At least that's how I like to compartmentalize these different brands. See, let me give you an example. Lewitt, they're pushing new tech. They also kind of have like a cutting edge design, things like that. They're doing stuff like dual stereo outputs. They're doing things like splitting the capsule basically into two different audio signals. They've got like a new industrial design that doesn't really harken back to any other older age of recording. And they have a more contemporary sound profile. And that kind of results in a more bright, sparkly tone. Austrian Audio is kind of doing a similar thing, although a little bit different. They're taking older designs, like the 414 design, and they're improving on them to bring them into a more modern context. They're evolving and refining the craft from the past. So Soyuz is kind of different from all of that. Soyuz has a much more old school approach. They make sure all of their microphones are handcrafted and they're hearkening back to what is called the golden age of audio engineering. This results in, quite frankly, the polar opposite to a Lewitt or an Austrian audio. They have a universally darker tone to their microphones and even their industrial design is very vintage and very stylized. Just look at this video. This is the video that they produced in order to introduce the Soyuz 1973. This can give you an idea, a little bit of what they're trying to market themselves as, as a, a brand. Do you miss the days when craftsmanship mattered? When work was done in-house? When a product went from idea to completion under the same roof? So do we. Our microphones are expensive and worth every penny. But until now, they've been out of reach for many. So we set ourselves the goal of designing a more affordable Soyuz, a people's mic. We present to you the Soyuz 1973. So you just heard it from the horse's mouth. This is Soyuz's attempt at making a budget-friendly microphone. Just a quick note before we keep going, it is important to mention that this microphone was actually sent to me by Soyuz. And hey, uh, you should also probably know that these are uh, Russian builders. This is a Russian company. Just given our political climate of today, just take that into account when you make your decision. So the problem is that cheaper, more budget-friendly price is $800. By all marks, still an incredibly expensive microphone. See, I'm always more wary of these high profile, more premium brands making a budget offering. Because oftentimes I feel like the lower budget brands have a better time punching up and making a more mid-range or premium product than these premium brands do at making a low-end product. And that's namely because these premium brands often don't make an affordable enough product. It's important to note that the Soyuz 1973 is entirely handcrafted. It's built superbly well and offers a level of refinement that you probably wouldn't get from these budget brands making a more expensive microphone. But I just can't help to think of another premium brand making a budget offering and some of the problems that that showed when that sort of thing happens. Neumann's TLM-102 has gotten one of the most notorious reviews on this channel because it was offering a budget-friendly home studio alternative, but it's still a Neumann. Except beyond the cheaper Neumann price, there wasn't really much about that microphone that suited the budget user kind of at all because there was just so much about that microphone that made it far less than ideal for anything less than a perfect studio environment. The mic was incredibly sensitive to environmental noise. Without the shock mount, absolutely crumbled when it came to the physical reverberation of sound. Anything like typing on keys, steps in the room, ambient heater noise even, that all got absorbed into the microphone and really bloated the low end. When it was in this sort of perfect ideal scenario with no noise around it, it sounded beautiful, but it couldn't exist in the chaos of a home studio environment. And on the surface, the 1973 seems to be put in a very similar position. No shock mount and a budget price that teeters around one grand whenever you start to factor in tax. So we'll see how this holds up in uh, sort of the, the chaoticness of a, a bedroom studio later. 
I can tell you that this review has been kind of hard to film because of how much this is picking up outside noise. I'm also in the middle of Brooklyn. This is a pretty extreme environment to be in. First though, let's go a little bit over the tonal quality of this microphone and some of the features that it has. Soyuz really did not skimp out here at all. You're using the exact same capsule that you find in the Model Up the bomblet, which starts at $1,400. And in addition to that, the bomblet doesn't have any sort of accessory pad unless you're like physically screwing in the one that comes with it. This actually just has a pad switch on the bottom. And that pad is either a 10 dB cut or a 20 dB cut. But besides that, you're left with some very similar features and measurements as something like the bomblet. You've got 140 dB max decibel level, which is plenty. You have a 33 millimeter gold sputtered capsule on one side and the same self noise of 18 dBA which this is the only spec that I was a little bit disappointed in especially for this expensive of a microphone it makes it kind of less than ideal for a, a voiceover scenario but in any other scenario it's completely fine and in most voiceover too it just happens to be if you process your signal a lot and you're just completely in a vacuum then you might hear some buzz. It's not horrible, but it's not ideal. But where they do begin to differentiate is actually in the tonal quality of these two microphones. So take a look at the frequency response of the 1973. You might notice that in the beginning when I was talking about how Soyuz has a noticeably dark, creamy sound, this frequency response doesn't seem to tell you that. The 1973 is a blend of a more neutral tone with a more brighter tone, kind of actually ending up further on the brighter side of the spectrum than the darker side, which is a stark change from their lineup and especially the bomblet. Take a look at the bomblet's frequency response. Where the 1973 boosts, the bomblet actually cuts, and where the 1973 cuts, the bomblet cuts even more. This is a much less aggressive tone than you would get on a normal Soyuz microphone, making it arguably more flexible in different sort of applications, but at the expense of maybe a less signature tone. Here, let's take a listen to the 1973 compared to the Lewitt 640 and the Rode NT1. The Lewitt is a, an incredibly bright microphone, and the Rode is kind of a neutral sort of reference point. And I wrote a haiku as an example, so... um enjoy the haiku. See if you can guess the uh, Soyuz out of the group here. And then after that, I've included a not blind comparison between the Lewitt and the 1973 on acoustic guitar. Here's a little piece about how to make toast well. Just use a toaster. Here's a little piece about how to make toast well. Just use a toaster. Here's a little piece about how to make your toast well. Just use a toaster. Okay, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. Despite the price, which I would argue is not budget, especially for the bedroom producer, do the actual qualities of this microphone line up with a budget microphone? By no means is this a scientific test, but I, I did some sort of tapping <laughs> on the microphone. And let's compare the way that this microphone handles that physical reverberation compared to something like the TLM-102. Thank you. 
it seems to me like the 1973 is more manageable than the 102 was whenever it comes to the sensitivity of, of the room, the environment around it. And while I do think that any microphone marketed towards the budget producer should include a shock mount, this does not necessarily need it as much as the 102 does, but come on, if a $200 microphone can put a shock mount in the case, so can you. And as I've mentioned before on a previous review I did of a Soyuz microphone, the bomblet, there is just something majestic about their industrial design, something that sort of transcends the more utilitarian aspect of a microphone. The unbrushed metal, the gold accented grill, it's built like a tank. I find myself reaching for this microphone and often Soyuz microphones, even when they're not the most applicable for any given setting, just because I, I like recording into them. I think it makes better performances. They're very inspiring sort of microphones. It sounds great. It's a beautiful piece of hardware, both inside and out. It's an inspiring tone with a frequency response that sounds great on a multitude of different instruments and also would suit a ton of different tonal characteristics for voiceover or for any singer. It's got a lot of applications to it. But to me, this is a hard price point to compete at for any microphone. To me, you just simply can't call $800 a budget microphone in this day and age. And there are many microphones for a cheaper price that offer more flexibility, more features too. Yes, they're gonna be made overseas. They're probably gonna lack the build quality that this microphone does. They're certainly not gonna be handcrafted. If I sound like I'm sitting on a fence here, it's kinda cause I am. Not every review ends with a definitive yes or no, a, a solid gear recommendation or, or no, you should stay away. It's good, it's a very good microphone, but when you market it towards the everyday working man musician or audio engineer, there's just more to consider. There's more competition to fight against, and it's hard to convince a budget user to spend $800. It's hard for me to recommend based on those reasons, not because it's a bad microphone, but because it, it's not a budget microphone. If you take it at face value, just as the microphone in a void, it's an awesome mic. But when you compare it to what you can get for that same price point, you could build a whole budget studio for that. So if you value handcrafted goods, you want like an unbelievable high level of build quality and a nice flexible tone. This could very easily be your daily driver microphone that you use on any number of sources. But you could just as easily buy four or five microphones and have budget to spare for an audio interface or monitors. Both are equally valid. It's just what you decide to prioritize. Anyways, I think I'll leave it there. Here's my Instagram. If you want to work on a project with me, you can email me here. There were so many times I was just jamming on this microphone. I'll play you a clip of me in my yard just jamming a little bit on the on the mic. See you later.